Uh, our next guest is a Chicago native who grew up the child of superstitious parents in a haunted house on the northwest side of Chicago. She's the publisher slash grave digger of Burial Day Books for Boutique Horror Press that publishes emerging horror writers and has produced an anthology of gothic stories. Her first horror novel, Santa Muerte, about the Mexican cult of death, will be released later this month by Postmortem Press. Please give a warm Tuesday funk welcome to Cynthia Cena Kaleo. <laughs> story called The Tapping, and um, our first anthology, and Monteria is my short story collection, so if you like it, on Amazon. I'm going to read two short stories from my collection for you this evening, and um, Loteria, I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with the Mexican board game. It's a it's similar to the American bingo, but it, as opposed to matching up corresponding numbers, you correspond images, and the images are pretty... Um, <coughs> They become embedded in folklore, and they're pretty legendary. Like you might see La Corazon, which is the heart. And so what I did, I, I researched uh, Latin American folklore, superstition, and myth for the past two years, and I wrote one short story for each of the 54 cards. And the, base, the, the focus was that there had to be some type of Latin American thing to it. And the stories don't necessarily take place in Latin America, but there might be some type of influence. So. The first short story I'm going to be reading for you is called El Cotoro, the Parrot. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? The parrot cried as Machi filled the water dish. Down the stairs! Down the stairs! The bird called. Machi laughed to himself. His nearly three foot tall emerald green macaw was like a tape recorder, playing back words and phrases exactly as she heard them. Repetition. That was the trick. The more she heard something, the more likely she was to attempt to say it, practicing those repeated words over and over again until she sounded almost human. Many neighbors had moved out over the years, with most citing that bird's eerily sounding cries as a major motivator. Sawing a woman in half, Machi said as he rubbed his gray-haired goatee. Can you say, sawing a woman in half? Of course the parrot didn't. His pet had learned to say almost all of his name, all of the names of his acts, except for that one, the once highlight of Machi's world-famous magic act. She was a quick learner, and that was why he brought Kaku with him to New York from Chile over 50 years ago. The allure of show business back then was enticing, magical. It's not like what show business was like presently. Today, the masses mostly look to multiplex movie theaters, video game consoles, and the internet for their entertainment. As a boy in Chile, tourists would surround him at his card table where he would guess repeatedly which card they had drawn from a deck. One day, a local businessman, who was a skeptic, brought with him his new, newly purchased deck of cards, unwrapped it, and pulled a card to which Machi guessed correctly. He was not a fake. He was just a boy who had grown up in the Chilo Archipelago, a town where witchcraft had been practiced for ages and ages, and where magical abilities were honed and celebrated. Machi soon learned to make things appear and disappear, and soon after, he left his card table and stepped onto the stage. He came alive under the lights in front of the audience, who would remain silently transfixed as he glided across the stage, commanding objects and people. He mesmerized and hypnotized with tricks and illusion. Soon, he became a, a great illusionist, traveling the Americas until the real America called New York. His assistant, Marlena, followed. With them, they brought exotic animals he had accumulated over time, the rabbits and doves, snakes and tigers. They also brought with them an impressive collection of custom-made props, human-sized boxes and water tanks. There were also the hats and scarves, suits and gowns, and of course there were chains, handcuffs, and well-sharpened blades and knives. The day he was set to make his great appearance on the New York stage, a storm began to move into the area. 
Charcoal-colored clouds looked down fiercely. The air grew bitingly cold and the world began to rumble. There was something he had once seen his elders do to appease the great sky. Quickly, he tried to remember that trick that he had seen as a young boy, and he scrambled to perform it, and suddenly the sky cleared. Marlena was lost, but still the show went on. New, lovelier assistants came along to join his act, and each time the weather threatened audience attendance, another att assistant went missing. His talents flourished, and soon he could make a grown man disappear. He could conjure a tiger from an empty box. Most impressively, he had learned to break free from his straitjacket in three minutes while suspended over a bed of knives as a flame burned on the rope and that held him. He was the master until television, movies, and special effects, video games, and the internet turned everyone away from true magic. Let me go! Let me go! The bird screeched. A snowstorm was reported to be moving in tonight. High winds knocked on his window, begging to enter. As Machi dressed himself in his finest, a sleek black tuxedo, and before he slipped on his white gloves, the bird screeched again. Tonight, the stage came calling again. A televised, TV, televised special to showcase new magical talents, men and women who performed and looked more like pop stars than magicians, but who still were inspired by him, Machi, El Sorcerer. Flurries of snow kissed his window, and he knew it was time to revive his old trick. He walked over to the corner of his tiny garden apartment surrounded by the ghosts of his magical past. Dust covered top hats and picture frames holding the essence of his fantastical years, posing alongside movie stars and celebrities. It hurts! It hurts! Kaku, please stop! Machi went back to his parrot, kneeled down and pushed aside the oriental rug in front of her massive black metal cage. He pulled up on the ring and opened the door that led below. He descended a flight of steps, feeling against the stone walls as he walked slowly down. At the bottom of the stairs, he flipped on the light and smiled when he saw the colorful, life-size poster of him and Marlena. In the center of the concrete room, a gagged beauty hung, suspended from the ceiling. She wore a green taffeta gown with a neckline that glittered as she swayed into the light from a single bulb in the room. Machi moved over to the wall and released the rope that held her up. The woman fell onto the stone surface. Her cheeks blazed red as Machi moved to an opposite wall where knives, blades, and swords hung delicately displayed. His fingers floated over each one meditatively until he settled on a sieve. Yanking it from the wall and holding the base in both hands, he turned. My name is Machi, the magnificent, magnificent sorcerer. I am a magician, and I learn magic from the great witches of my land. I can make a man disappear and reappear, saw a woman in half and put her back together, and simply enough, I can pull a rabbit from a hat. <coughs> These are simple things that all magicians can do, but I can control the weather. I can make the rain cease, the clouds part, and the snow stop, all for a price, of course. All great magic, all powerful magic requires this human sacrifice. He raised the sieve, and above, Kao Ku finally screamed, Sawing a woman in half! Sawing a woman in half! <laughs> and there is a belief in that small town in Chile where um, shamans are taught as young children to do card tricks for tourists for money, and it's also believed that some of these shamans can control the weather. I don't know how, but... Yeah. <laughs>